Hello, friends. I'm so happy to be here talking about developer productivity with you. And I'm going to talk about 10 different tips and tools that you can adopt in 15 minutes or less each. So these are a bunch of little ideas that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. And if you want to adopt them, it's not a lot of effort. You can just try something out. So no big commitments here and a bunch of things to choose from. Let's get started. We're going to go through the 10 tips and you'll see a few examples along the way. First of all, let's talk about the command prompt, shell, terminal, whether you're on Windows or Mac or Linux. We're always, as a developer, working with a command line. There's all sorts of things we have to do to get our jobs done. But if you open up your terminal and it looks like this, or you open up your command prompt on Windows and it looks like basic cmd.exe, that's a problem. You're missing a huge opportunity for a very, very powerful system to do a whole bunch more. So let's look at another option. Over here, we have my terminal on my Mac OS here. And notice there's some colors going on. If I type something like Control C, you can see that there's a little red arrow instead of a green arrow. That means that last command failed. Let's go over to a more interesting directory, one that is, say, a GitHub repository. Notice the prompt changes, and over here you can see git colon master. It actually shows you the branch, the status of the git in this repository that we're in. We do an ls, we get colors for like directories versus files, all sorts of cool stuff there. There's great autocomplete. So for example, if I want to go back in my history and just see all the things I've done with brew, I just hit brew and then up arrow and it just shows me all the commands that I previously run by using the arrow key that start with brew. That's fantastic. And you even get autocomplete for higher order things such as well, Git. So if I, I know I want to branch, I think, or something start with a B, I hit tab and it says, oh, you could bisect or you could branch. And I can even tab over and hit, hit that one. So, yep, that's actually the one that I wanted. So this is Oh My Z Shell. The recommendation is maybe check out Oh My, oh My Z Shell, but the real recommendation here is to just look at some alternatives. So for Mac OS and for Linux, I strongly recommend Oh My Z Shell. I think it's really, really great. There's many other options as well. If you're on Windows, you can use Oh My Posh. And this actually works in other places. Notice this part right here, all these colors. You've got the green, you've got, actually here's the Git repository and the changes, all the stuff going on here. So really, really nice. This works on PowerShell, for example. So Oh My Z Shell doesn't. All right, so first recommendation is get a very proper shell that is built for developers to do developer things and really you're gonna be super happy. Finally, if you're on Windows, don't use command prompt and maybe don't even use straight PowerShell directly. Use the new Windows terminal and see the link at the bottom. It's much better than what you have before. Number two, security. If you run a web app, you want to make sure that your web app is secure. Well, how do you do that? You can go check in with OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. They have all these recommendations and top 10 security holes or problems that we've seen over time. But how do you keep up with them? How do you keep them in your app? Well, there's this really cool project called Secure, a package called Secure, uh, or secure Pi over in the Python space. And if you're not a Python person, just hang tight. What you can do is very simply create one of these secure headers and you just go to your framework. For example, here in this tween section, you write these three lines of code and you say secure headers dot framework dot pyramid upgrade this response to a secure one or with Flask or with Django. It supports many, many Python frameworks. And if you do this, come back over here and have a quick look. We're doing that over on talk Python training. Let's do a request. We'll see what headers we get back from our requests. We look at our headers. Notice there's 12 responses and we get things like strict transport security, X frame embedding options to prevent people from embedding our responses, no sniff, uh, restricted referrer policies and so on. All of these are put into our requests automatically by secure Pi. Again, if you're not a Python person, Maybe you're in .NET, you work with ASP.NET. There's something like this called NWebSec. And you can see this link here to a blog post by Scott Hanselman that talks about it. If you're in another technology, there's likely a library like this that you can just plug in and add all these secure headers that make your website, well, more secure. Number three, we saw the command prompt. Well, you shouldn't only use command prompts. 
maybe if you're doing Git, you should think about using some kind of GUI. I know a lot of people want to just keep it straight, simple, and easy, and just use the command prompt, but there's a lot of things you can see with a proper UI. So I recommend that you check out SourceTree. SourceTree is a Git client, a Git GUI, and it seems to have almost all of the features of Git. So if you want to do pushes, rebases, and all sorts of, you know, sort of more advanced types of things, all those are still there. It doesn't hide very much from you, but you get the benefit of having a lot more visual information. You can also check out GitHub Desktop. That works on all the OSs. If you're working with an IDE like PyCharm or Visual Studio, they come with built-in Git. So consider using that there. Like for in this example, you can see this commit is going to add a function, can evade, to this class here. That's way better than just, you know, git add dot git commit dash m. I think I remember what I did. You can see exactly what you did. And even with the Visual Studio and PyCharm or IntelliJ, you can access things like pull requests and check them out, check out the what's going to happen, play with it, and then decide whether or not you're going to approve it. So all sorts of good stuff. Visual Studio Code has it built in as well. So be sure to remember your UIs for Git. Speaking of Git, have you ever created a fork of a repository? So you find something you like. So for example, here we have the secure project that I was just telling you about before. I forked it over to my personal GitHub repository. But as that library, the original changes, you're going to be behind and maybe you don't want to be. Traditionally, what you've had to do is you've had to go to the command prompt, you had to go and add an origin and then pull the origin and then check out the main branch and then merge the origin into the main and then you commit that back and ugh, just to keep it in sync. So GitHub recently added a fetch upstream to all forks. So if I go to my fork page, it says, oh, your fork is two commits behind, click fetch and merge, and we will just catch it up. So if you have a forked brand, uh, if you have a forked repo that you really care about, be sure to do this because it'll keep you in sync much easier than before. Error logging and reporting. You're probably logging, right? In your, in your technology, Python, .NET, Java, whatever it is, they all come with built-in logging frameworks. And my experience is they're almost all bad. I don't know why, but they just kind of seem clumsy to use. They're a little bit extra work or they're over-designed or you name it. So I encourage you to check out some cool external logging packages that you can bring in. So in the Python world, I use something called Logbook, which is a really simple, nice way to create rotating files for your log files and add extra info. Another really popular one is Log Guru or Log Guru, and really, really nice. And regardless of what technology you're working in, I'm sure that there are some much better logging frameworks. But also, it's not just about putting messages into files, it's about notifications and tracking and categorization and stuff. So look into uh, services like Sentry, where you can do a little integration with your site, and if there's an error, or other types of information that'll automatically get saved at Sentry, then you'll get a notification. Hey, there was an error in your site. And you can go see the log, you can see the trace back or the stack trace and figure out what's going on. You'll see all the variables, maybe who was logged in. Super, super helpful. So better logging with better packages. Don't just do the default usually. And then you can actually add some services on for notification and much just much better stuff so you actually know what's going on in your site. Speaking of sites, you want to keep them secure? It used to be that you'd have to pay $200 and get approved for an SSL certificate. That's completely silly. Those, those days are long gone. Let's Encrypt is now a thing that automatically generates free SSL certificates. So if you've got a website, it needs to have SSL. Google is treating websites that are not secure. Well, as not secure and they're not showing up as well in search results. They're being sort of looked down upon in the UI of things like Chrome and so on. So you really want to have SSL, even if you don't really need it for your site. I mean, maybe you're not actually storing anything secure, but the infrastructure of the web is starting to expect it. So you want it. Just adding Let's Encrypt to your site, if it's hosted on Linux, is incredibly easy. You install, you basically add a repository for the universe. You say get uh, apt-get install certbot, Python 3 certbot nginx. 
And then all you have to do is say certbot dash dash nginx. It looks at all the domains that are set up under say nginx, and it'll suggest creating and maintaining and automatically renewing certificates for that. Uh, it supports other servers other than nginx. It just happens to be the example I have here. So you can see the, the docs down at the bottom there. But if you've got a website and you're in charge of running the server, make sure that you use something like Let's Encrypt so that it's secure. This one is a very fun one. If you want to have unit tests for a web app, web API, something like that, one thing you can do is sit down and write a whole bunch of tests. And you probably should do that. You should be testing your code, of course. But there's a really, really simple technique, I almost said trick. It's not really a trick, it's a technique or a shortcut, maybe is the best word, for really quickly just deciding if your site mostly works. Because when it breaks, it's not like, well, the box is off to the side or this piece is hidden. No, usually what happens when a website breaks is it crashes the server 500 error and it breaks hard. So if your site has a sitemap, and it likely does because you want it to look good and you want it to present itself to Google, right? This is an XML document that shows what URLs are there. You can leverage the sitemap to basically request every single page on your site as part of an integration test and decide, is it working or is it not working? So let's check that out over here. So over at Talk Python to Me, the podcast website, we have a sitemap, as you can imagine. These have lots of pages. For example, the Talk Python training one has about 4,000 pages listed in its sitemap. And what we can do in this one is we can go and just write a very small test here that will go and request the sitemap, then use a little XPath XML DOM stuff to figure out what all the URLs are, convert them from global, because you don't want to request the production one, you want to request your test one, and then just run it. So if we go over here and just run this test individually, you can see down at the bottom here, it's just going and hitting every single one of these pages, and it's cranking through it. I think there's probably three or 400 here for this site. And every one of them passed, so hey, it looks like your test passed. How long did that take? 10 seconds, not very long at all but it's a really simple and easy way to make sure the site is going. And what's cool is when you add something new, the sitemap is updated, right? You add something in the database, it regenerates the sitemap because you want that to show up for search. Well, you can just piggyback on that and make sure that those pages keep working all the time through continuous integration and so on. So super, super easy technique here to just run a simple request against every page that you have on your site and make sure that it well doesn't break. Here's a simple code, at least in Python, set up some test code, get a hold of the sitemap.xml, and then as we saw, just use XML processing to pull out the URLs and then request every single one of those individually. If they all work with a 200 or a 201 or something like that, maybe even a 302, they don't do 404s and they don't do 500s, you're in a really good place. All right. Somewhat related to the SSL thing, Google is also treating sites that are not fast and don't provide a good user experience less well, as in deranking them in search and so on. And one really, really important site that you can check is called uh, PageSpeed Insights. This is from Google. You can put your URL in here and if you've never done this, prepare yourself to be somewhat disappointed. So for example, I put in Talk Python Training here. That website responds usually from a request hitting the server till it goes out the other side, usually 10 to 30 milliseconds. And I thought, well, of course Google's gonna think this site is fast, that's fantastic, right? Nope, I put that in there and I think, you can see the little scale here at the bottom, I think I got a 55. That's the bottom end of slow to average. I'm like, whoa, this is a problem. How is this possible? Well, it's possible because it doesn't take into just the server response time for websites. You know, what it looks at is, well, if you serve lar large images and they have to be resized and it's, say, on a phone, well, how much time is that going to take? And, well, how long is it until the JavaScript renders the front end bits so the user actually sees that? And is there a lot of JavaScript that's slowing down the page? And so on and so on. So there's many, many different things that you can 
work on. And if you scroll down and you put your, pay, your site in here and you scroll down this page, you'll see tons of concrete recommendations. So I got my 55 or whatever it was, and I was disappointed, but I went through the recommendations and I didn't take all of them, but I took many of them. And now you can see 99. That is super, super cool. I still have a little work to do on mobile. They added some new tests that I got to come back to, I suppose. But really, if you have a website and you want it to rank high and have a good user experience, this is incredibly helpful. If you have to install software, do you go and download it? If I want Python, do I go to python.org and download it? If I want Node, do I go and download Node and install it? I can. What if there's an update? How do I know there's an update? How do I perform that update, right? So I go download it again and install it over top of the old one. No, don't do that. Use something like Homebrew. If you're on Mac OS, Homebrew is fantastic because you can say brew install MongoDB and now you have MongoDB plus anytime there's updates, it'll just automatically update it for you. Brew install Python will give you the latest Python 3. If you're not on Mac OS, maybe you're on Linux, well, Linux has it built in, right? This is the one place uh, where Linux has had this all the time, right? We've got apt on Ubuntu and so on. So nothing to do if you're on Linux, but if you're on Windows, you can't use Homebrew. And Windows, this is not a very common idea, but I would recommend you check out Chocolatey. Chocolatey is the same idea. You can say, I want to install this library or this package or this application, and it'll download it and its dependencies and keep it up to date for you. Speaking of dependencies, number 10, the last one, if you've got a web app or any kind of app really, but it's super important that you keep the dependencies up to date and fresh, but especially if something that has an open port on the internet, it's even more important. So let's go through what this might look like. Well, you can say, I have tools that I just installed. So in say in Python, I would say pip install pyramid to get the pyramid web framework. No big deal. It's great. That gives me the latest. Oh, unless you've already got it installed, then you get the message, the requirement is already satisfied. Even if it's old, even if it's out of date, no, you have it installed. No big deal. I'll just add the dash dash upgrade. That'll get me the latest. Nope, it, it does give you the latest, but there's a bunch of dependencies that themselves, you know, when you install Pyramid, it transverses the dependencies and installs those. Those also have to be separately updated. Huh, now what? What if there's a security issue? Like what if there's a vulnerability in Pyramid? I need to fix it right away. Will I get a notification or do I have to remember to do this all the time? No big deal. You pin your version and GitHub will give you updates. Yes. But do you get regular feature updates or only important updates about bug, um, security bugs, right? So you can use Dependabot, which is now part of GitHub. They were acquired by GitHub and they will look at your requirements for your different technologies, whether it's Node.js or .NET or Python or whatever, and it will tell you when there are new dependencies and actually do PRs over to your repository. So if you've got something on GitHub and you have some kind of requirements file, go ahead and add Dependabot to that. That's great. You can also use pyup.io. I kind of like how they work better, but they're, they're a paid service and they're not part of GitHub, so you can decide. And of course, that one's just for Python, right? Dependabot is more broad. All right. Well, that is it. Those are the 10 tips. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to watch. I hope you found them useful. If you want to follow me on Twitter, follow me over there. I'm at M Kennedy. If you want to learn more about these kinds of things, especially with the Python bent, check out Talk Python to Me, one of the podcasts that I run that does like deep, long form conversations. And then Python Bytes, which is like a weekly newsletter with analysis in the Python and technology space. And of course, if you want to learn things, about Python and that ecosystem, check out Talk Python training. With that, thanks so much. It's been great to be here with you.